when you meditate, the question of balance is very important. This is especially true when you're off meditating on your own, away from a teacher, where there's no chance to go running to the teacher with questions. You've got to learn how to gauge and have develop a sense of just right in your meditation. And we can talk about balance in abstract terms, but when you're dealing with the breath, the breath is a good way of monitoring the question of balance in the mind. In other words, there are a lot of teachings where the Buddha talks about balancing different qualities. He says when the mind is seems to have too much energy, then you try to use calming qualities, like serenity, concentration, equanimity. When the mind is too sluggish, you try to develop qualities that are more enlivening, like actively analyzing what's going on in the present moment, putting a lot of effort, being really persistent in what you're doing, and trying to develop a sense of rapture with the meditation, because rapture is enlivening. And so on one level, it's good to get a sense of where your energy level is. and figure out what kind of quality you want to develop. Mindfulness, he says, is good in all qualities. And when he uses the word mindfulness alone, he means both mindfulness and alertness. In other words, keep in, keep in mind the question, okay, what's just right here? And then look to see what is just right. And have a sense of where your mind is leaning, in one direction or the other. Then apply the appropriate quality. But sometimes that all seems too abstract, so a good way of looking at it really directly is right here at the breath. How does the breath feel? How is the, your ability of the mind to stay with the breath? Can it not stay with the breath because it's too antsy or because it, its energy level isn't up to staying with the breath? That's a good measure right there. And then you figure different ways of breathing and also different ways of relating to the breath to overcome the problem of too much energy or too little energy. But a lot of this sense of just right comes from watching over time. This is why meditation is not just something you do for a short period of time and get it all done with so you can go on with the rest of your life. It's something that you do time and time again, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, and you get a better and better sense of just right comes from watching for long periods of time. Now remember with the question of balance, to think about a balance, kind of scales they used to use. It's not going to stay just evenly balanced all the time. The nature of a balance is if you put your finger down on one side, it swings widely for a while until it finally corrects itself and brings it back to balance. In other words, expect that there are going to be periods of imbalance in your meditation. And the only way we can realize that is to watch it over time. And when the time comes when you have to bring it back into balance, sometimes it's going to require some pretty extreme methods. We hear about right effort or the middle way. We have the idea what well, means some kind of middling way, where you put a little bit of effort into it, but not too much. But that's not what the middle way means at all. It means a way that's appropriate for what the situation is at hand. In other words, when the mind is really sluggish, you've, sometimes you have to try extreme methods of waking it up. And other times when it's just bouncing all over the place, you have to use some pretty extreme methods to calm it down. So the middleness of the middle way doesn't mean that you just keep things in a middling level of effort or a middling level of attention. But it means you gain a sense of what's just right for each particular imbalance how to bring it back into balance. Once it gets balanced, how to keep it there. Once it's in balance, then it's a lot easier than that. It's the question of what's the just right amount of pressure to put on it. It's like learning how to sail a boat. When you first get out in the water and you have a sense the boat is tipping over, your, your tendency is to overreact. You pull the rudder the, too far in the other direction and it flips the boat over. Too far in the other direction, flips it over the other way. But after a while of flipping it over and getting thrown into the ocean, 
you begin to get a better sense of how much pressure is needed on the rudder. So eventually, you just keep your hand on the rudder, and it's almost instinctive. Just a little bit of pressure here, a little bit of pressure there, a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, and it stays on even keel. It's the same with driving a car. In the beginning, it's hard to get a sense of what's oversteering and what's understeering. But after a while, you gain a sense till it's almost it's instinctive. You hardly think about it at all. That's the kind of quality you want to develop in the meditation. And it's a willingness to learn from your mistakes that's going to make all the difference. When you've noticed that you were putting too much pressure on the breath, or at other times when you're not putting enough pressure on the breath. When you're getting too obsessive about adjusting the breath, or when you're getting lazy about adjusting the breath. You have to watch for this, so that you can develop your own sense of just right. Once you have that sense of just right, you've got your internal teacher. And you can go anywhere. Until you get that internal teacher, nobody can trust you. You can't trust yourself as a meditator. You tend to go off too far in one direction, too far in the other direction. You get fanatic about this, get fanatic about that. But if you watch and notice and look for cause and effect, this is the, the main thing right here. Instead of just having a narrow attitude, well, this must be right, I'm going to hold on to this no matter what. Well, watch, check for things, look at the results that come, and learn how to back off when you're getting too heavy in one direction or the other. So there's a willingness to make mistakes, but there also has to be a willingness to recognize mistakes. That's your governor. That's what keeps the meditation on an even keel, it keeps it going from overboard in one direction or another. So it comes down to a few simple principles. One, be as sensitive as possible to what you're doing, and two, be sensitive to the results. And when you see the results aren't what you like, well, make adjustments. And then watch again, watch again. Keep watching and doing, watching and doing. And this is how skill develops. So skill basically means look, being sensitive to kind of the raw materials you're given at any given moment. And then two, being sensitive to what you're doing. And then three, being sensitive to what the results are. These three things, when you put them together, give the mind a chance to develop skill. It was this realization that made the Buddha realize further that the principle of karma really does work. And if there were no if it were impossible to develop skills, then we wouldn't really know that when we act, are we really acting through our own will or is something acting through us? Or really is there action happening anyway at all, or is it just all a delusion? All those questions would be really up in the air. But the fact that we can develop skill means, yes, action does come from us. Action is real to begin with. And secondly, we are responsible for our actions, and we can change our actions through noticing the results. That's why there's hope for human beings. So if you plunge into the meditation and say, well, my way of doing this is going to be this, 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 this. Well, where does that attitude come from? It comes out of ignorance. Unless you're willing to change the attitude, adjust it, you're going to remain in ignorance, no matter how many hours you sit, no matter how many years you meditate. But this willingness to, to act and then to look at the results. is why it's worthwhile to practice, why it was worthwhile for the Buddha to teach people to begin with. So we have to develop this sensitivity to our intentions, this sensitivity to our actions and the results. This is why the Buddha's most basic teaching is one I've been watching intention. He is teaching to Rahula, his son. <clears throat> Rahula was about seven years old at the time. And the Buddha paired the 
teaching down to its really simplest form. He says, before you act, look at your intention. What kind of results do you expect, expect from an intention, that kind of intention? <clears throat> and if you expect harmful results, then stop. Don't follow through with it. If you expect harmless results, you can go ahead and act. While you're acting, keep watch, because some of the results of your actions are going to come out immediately. And if you see anything horrible coming, stop. If there's nothing harmful, you can continue. When you're done with the act, then start looking for long-term results of your actions. And if you see that what you thought originally was going to be harmless actually turned out causing harm, and this can be from really gross levels to very subtle ones, then resolve that you're not going to make that mistake again. Talk it over with other people who are practicing, people you trust, to get their perspective on it too. And this one basic teaching contains the seeds for a lot of other important things in the Buddha's teachings as well. The whole principle of causality, that you don't wait until after the action is done to see its results. Some of the results come right away, which is make, what makes the whole question of cause and effect complex, but at the same time it's what makes skills possible. As you're planing a piece of wood, you can notice immediately if, you're, if the plane is digging too deep or not digging deep enough. And you can adjust right in the middle of each swipe across the board. It's not until after you've made your swipe at the board that you look at it and say, whoops, something wrong. You can sense while you're doing it, as you get more and more sensitive, you can sense what the results are going to be as you do the action, and you can make adjustments accordingly. And it also teaches that the results of our actions come out in two kinds, skillful and unskillful, or harmless and harmful. So you've got cause and effect, skillful and unskillful. That's the basic framework for the Four Noble Truths. I've always found it interesting when reading through the Buddhist text to look at the way the Buddha talks to children, or the teachings that were specifically directed at children, because they're, they're very revealing. They cut things down to the most basic level in ways that you miss if you're looking at the really abstract teachings like emptiness and not-self or whatever. Look at the kind of questions the people the Buddha had children ask as they were practicing. It really grounds you in what the teaching is all about. So as you practice, always keep this teaching to Rahula in mind. Watch your intentions. Watch your actions, watch the results, both while you're acting and after they're done. This applies not only to the meditation, but everything you do in the course of the practice, when you make your life your practice. And when you're not sure of the results, well, just keep watching. This experimental attitude towards life is a very important part of really developing, really growing as a person. If you develop really fixed attitudes very early on, it's hard to learn anything from that point on. And you notice, it's, it's the people who start getting fixed in their attitudes. There's a sense where they've stopped growing. And that can happen at any age. It's not just the old people who get fixed in their attitudes. Sometimes young people are more fanatic than older people. So it's this willingness to adjust, to learn, all the way to the point where you retain awakening. And even then, you've got to watch and watch and watch again to make sure that what you thought was awakening really is. There's a really nice passage in Ajahn Mahabhu's teachings. It talks about the time when Ajahn Mun passed away, and he had this very strong sense that he was like a wild beast left off in the forest without anyone to care for him, now that his teacher was gone. And then he stopped and asked himself, well, what were the things that Ajahn Mun kept stressing over and over again in his teachings, take those as your internal teacher. And the one point that really struck him stronger than anything else was his statement that when something comes up in the mind and you're not really sure about whether it's worth following through or not, just step back to that basic sense of knowing and stay with that. For those of, those of us at the beginning, this means staying with your, the basic knower at the breath, and just kind of watch what happens. 
to that particular mind state, to that particular vision, whatever it is that comes up in the mind. That particular understanding. Sometimes our understandings that come as flashes in the mind. You've really got to stop and watch them. See, where is this going to lead? And then John Munn said that if you can stay with that sense of knowing, just being aware, without latching on to the object that you're aware, then no matter what, you'll be able to get past that state, whatever it was, good or bad. So take these principles as your internal teacher, as you're practicing, having a sense of balance, being sensitive to what you're doing, sensitive to what the results of your actions are, both while you're doing them and after they're done. And always be open to the fact that what you saw at one point, maybe you didn't see the whole picture. Back up and watch again, watch again, watch again. There's nothing lost by not being too too quick to come to a fixed conclusion. And keep experimenting. When you practice, it's not the sort of place where you have to have an opinion and there's something wrong with you if you don't have an opinion on everything that comes up. That was one of the most important things I learned when I went to Thailand and started staying with the John Fu. Being an Oberlin grad, you're used to having an opinion, and not only that, that you were supposed to have an opinion on all kinds of topics. I remember one time a John Fu happened to walk past while I was expounding to one of the other monks on something. He said, do you really know what you're talking about? I says, well, I think I do. Well, do you really know? If you don't know, well, just say you don't know and leave it at that. It simplified life an awful lot. It made life easier not only for me, but also for the people I used to expound things to. And you've got to have that attitude as you meditate. If you're not 100 percent certain, and again, you've got to watch for your certainty too, because sometimes certainty is just a cover-up for ignorance. But if you don't really know, well, admit, I don't really know. I'm ready to watch, ready to experiment. Sometimes I use the word in the meditation, play with the breath. Well, that means experiment, watch, and have a good time while you're doing it. But always be ready to admit the fact, well, maybe there's a lot that I don't know yet. I'm just willing to watch and learn. That's your salvation as a meditator.